Um, but basically, it's the, the brilliance of this is that it is not connected to doing some good writing. I mean, other, other systems are fine too, right? So you might, a lot of the books that I'll cite at the end say that, you know, you should do things like, um, hey, come in. Um, that you do things like write a certain number of words a day, and that's fine too. Um, but the thing that's nice about the 45 minute unit is that it's not, it's totally non evaluative, right? It's just that you've done that work. And so this also allows you to sort of disaggregate the person who's writing from the person who's editing and commentating and telling you that you're a bad student. And, you know, you just sort of, you just kind of want to move that person to the side so that you can get some work done. So that's the thing about the 45 minute unit. Yeah? What if you're like really on a roll, can you go over your 45 minutes? Or? Okay, so the question is, if you're really on a roll, can you go over the 45 minutes? And the answer is a no. <laughs> you cannot. You can just make a little note, and you can take a 30 second break where you look out the window. But it's true. So you do keep going that day? Yeah, you just yeah. Over yeah, you're allowed to, let's say that you, ha you wanted to go for three units, and you, you feel like totally inspired and energetic and you want to do four, then you do it. But it's always okay also to know what you want to say next and just write down what you're going to say next. So you have a note at the end of the, you know, like in my documents I call it below the line. I have like a set of stars. And below the line I'll say things like, really important to get back to this point tomorrow, you know, you just have a thing where you say what you're going to say but you're not necessarily actually writing it. So it's always okay to stop before you're totally done saying everything you think you can say. That's actually really useful especially when you're feeling inspired. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so number three is project weeks. So this, is, this can be part of planning ahead. Weeks are a better unit of um, evaluating how you're doing than days or months. So you can have something that you wanna get done by the end of a particular week. And that is actually something that is measurable. It means that when you're working on a particular day, if you're off on that day, you don't have, you know, you're just not in it, that's okay, right? Because you still have three more days of your week. So project weeks means that you, when you're planning, you have a set of things that you want to try to get to. And that might be as simple as, I want to do two units a day of research or writing this week. Project weeks also means that you figure out when your work week on your thing is gonna start and when it's gonna end. So that you have a sense that you actually are doing something, kind of in the way that you have a job, but not necessarily exactly like that. And that connects to part four, which is that you set a stop time for any day, any given day. And these stop times can change day by day, depending on what the rest of your schedule looks like. But in the same way that having a 45 minute uni unit that you actually stop, is, you know, whatever's happening, you actually pause, for whatever reason, having a time of day that you really commit yourself to stopping means that you are more efficient working during the day. You don't end up working until 10 at night. It could be that you wanna have your stop time be 10 at night, that's okay. But if your stop time is seven, because you really like to watch the national, I don't know if actually the national's on at seven. Or nation. <laughs> if you really want it, then that is a perfectly reasonable way, re way to stop your day. So the idea here is that you decide when you're going to stop, and even if you haven't done the things that you wanted to do that day, you still stop. And the next day, for some reason, you're, you know that you're going to have to get those things done. So I don't know, I also don't know why this part works, but it does. You determine a stop time, you just decide on one. What about if you're sort of the opposite and it's getting up in the morning that's hard but you can stay till three in the morning is it does it work equally well if you have a, <coughs> if you sort of set a start time <laughs> start times apparently don't for some reason start times don't work as well as stop times okay. so you can have your stop time be 3 a.m that's okay. okay right but it's the important thing is to have the time when you stop right like it's so and the important thing is that you structure stuff so that there's a way that you are actually gonna um, get stuff done and have the rest of your life actually. Yeah. 
So this is also connected to determining when your week starts, which is when are you going to start working on your project in a given week. And usually this will happen after number six, which is taking a day off, which is kind of like sacrilegious or something. But it's really important that as an entitlement, not as a reward for your work, you take a day off in whatever way that, whatever that means to you, that you do that. So for a lot of people that is sitting on the couch eating bonbons and reading novels. You know, for other people it might be going for a run and then going yard sailing. Whatever it is, it's, it is, a, it is reasonable to take a day off. It is good. Um, it's something you should do. And you're, you should allow yourself to do it. And it will make you more useful and more effective writing. So if you're someone who's writing on science fiction, taking a day off does not mean reading science fiction. <laughs> if you're, you know, if you work in a lab, taking a day off does not mean doing fun things in the lab. It's like something else than what you're doing, okay? So you just decide when you're gonna do it, and you really try to stick to it. And again, this is something that I am sort of, like I feel proselytizing about, because I've seen some really sort of type A, very tense people who don't feel like they can take a day off, they're never gonna be able to get their work done, they have to just work, 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 start doing this, and have a kind of relaxation and openness start with their writing, which is really important, and actually allows them to have, you know, for some of you, this is, you're gonna spend five years working on a dissertation, and if you spend that entire time in a state of sort of like adrenal overload, where you're totally stressed out all the time, and you don't ever give yourself permission to relax, you're really gonna be unhappy, and you're gonna get ulcers. Like, I've got ulcers. You know, I was in my third year of grad school and I couldn't eat anything. It's terrible. I don't recommend it. And I think that if I'd been taking a day off in this kind of entitled, not reward kind of way, it might not have happened. So I give that to you in your <laughs> non ulcerous stomachs. Oh, any other, sorry, any questions about that, that stuff? How yeah. often should you take a day off? Once a week, at least. be able to do is one sip. Sorry, other <coughs> Okay, so you'll see that one of the themes here is this question of knowing when to stop and predetermining when to stop in a certain way. So something to ask yourself, um, if you're having, if you're running into serious roadblocks with the research, if you're having a hard time with something that you're working on, you can ask yourself, is your procrastination or is your feeling that you cannot work actually telling you something very important that you should listen to? It might be that it's not that you're just being a bad student or that you don't have anything to say about this topic or that you're never gonna be able to do this. It might be that actually you do need to go do a little bit more research. Sometimes that's the case. It's more often the case that you over-research and um, you need to stop doing that. But mm -hmm. do you wanna ask about this? Is all procrastination bad? So the question was, is all procrastination bad? And I think no. I mean, I think that framing procrastination as bad might be a bad thing. Pardon? Framing procrastination as bad might be a bad thing. Yeah. Um, it, there's a seat here. Um, this, is why, this is why this sort of end times and taking a day off and um, having a plan that you go in for <coughs> In some cases, procrastination is a, an important signal um, that you need to do a particular different kind of work or that you haven't gotten something that you need to get at. Sometimes it's just telling you that you're really tired and you can't work on stuff, you know? So I think that in general, if you're sitting down to work and you find yourself messing around on the computer or, you know, that might be a signal that you need to eat a good meal or finish raking the leaves or, or rearrange stuff in your life, right? Um, because the space of procrastination tends to be a space that feels really crummy. It tends to be a space where you feel guilty, you feel sort of self-indulgent, and yet you're not really indulging, you're not really enjoying what you're doing, you know? So, so I think in general it's not like it's a bad thing, but I do think that in terms of the writing process it's something to try to minimize, and to be sort of strategic about how you're, how you're working with it, um, and to not let yourself spend entire days um, playing solitaire on the computer, um, but instead to be like, why am I playing solitaire on the computer, you know? 
What is that saying? What is, what's happening? <laughs> I'm on ANS committee, so I know that you're not a huge procrastinator. Um, so that's one thing about pausing, right? But something about the, the ultimate stopping, and this is about also seeing the dissertation as a whole. There's a lot of people who said, can I come even if I can only come for an hour? Can I come even if I'm going to be an hour late? So, um, there's going to be is to be able to check in with yourself and with faculty about when you're done. So there's something that happens with pieces of writing is that often they proliferate. And if you have a clear sense of what the whole arc of the project is going to be, it's going to be much easier for you to see when you're actually meeting that arc, when you're done. Another way to check in on that is to ask the faculty you're working with. Like, I feel like I'm coming to the end of this drafting process. Do you agree? You're allowed to do that. It's perfectly acceptable. So. You have aims for a piece of writing, and you should be able to look at that piece of writing and see when you're actually meeting those aims. One way to do that is this useful phrase. So if you are starting the thesis or starting the dissertation, it's, um, it's useful to say this to yourself and try to fill in what you, what, what you hope to show. So you say, in this piece of writing, I hope to show something. Um, or in this piece of writing, I aim to do this. So you have something that you know you're trying to do, and then it's easier for you to tell, for you and your faculty, to tell when you're actually doing it. Yeah. Can you use that last quote for like every chapter, or just for the whole thesis? You can use that for, I mean, as a tool, you can use that phrase for every paragraph, right? In this paragraph, I hope to show. You want to take that out in the final draft. <laughs> oh, <of course. laughs> no, but it's a super useful technology. Because if you get to a paragraph and you're like, I don't know what I hope to show in this paragraph, your readers are probably going to be like, I don't know what she hopes to show in this paragraph. Yeah. So there's, and when we talk about sort of the arc of writing, that's something that you want to be able to say about the whole thing. And it also is something that when you're applying for grants, or when you're applying to grad school, or when you're applying you know, for jobs, being able to say what you did in one sentence is very useful. You know, in my thesis, I showed. Or in my thesis, I addressed. In my thesis, I argued. Having those phrases is very, very useful. Yeah. It's just, it, it, it's interesting when I'm an undergrad student, and you have a bunch of papers all due at the same time work away on one until you get to a place where you're kind of stuck. So then you put that down and work on another one for a while. In the meantime, in the back of your head, you're sorting out that problem. Mm -hmm. But something as big as a dissertation, I find I can be working on a piece of it now, and I get to a place where that's yucky or it's stuck, or mm -hmm. I know I'm going to have to go back and read something boring. But in the meantime, there's another place in the same. So that's just something that I found can help me yeah. avoid Right. To to not be, so that to avoid procrastination, one thing to do is to not be thinking that you have to work linearly yeah. through things, but allow yourself to have the flexibility to work on different different parts of the dissertation as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. We should be taking a break at this unit now. <laughs> um, so at any stage, one of the things to remind yourself about is that academic writing is a genre, and it's a tool. And there's good academic writing and bad academic writing. And good academic writing does not translate to good writing, um, necessarily. There are lots of forms of writing that are excellent. If you decide that you want to do this kind of writing, it's important to be able to understand what in your particular discipline counts as good academic writing. So to read models of it and to try to aim yourself toward that. So it doesn't mean that you shut down your creative capacities or your lyricism um, or your capacity to express yourself, but that you 
understand that this is a particular way of talking about the world that is specific to this context and that you can actually master. So when you're writing, it's useful to cultivate this kind of, uh, this mode of authorship where you think about how things get spoken in the literature that you're reading, the conversation that you're having, that your thesis or dissertation participates in. And while staying very clear and being able to say what you're saying in any given um, paragraph and sentence even, you actually write to the way that that genre sounds. Um, so one way to think about this, particularly for all the people here who are doing interdisciplinary work, is to think about what do you need to do in your writing in order to make the conversation that you're having accessible and legible to the people who you want to be in conversation with. And one of my favorite metaphors for academic writing is as a conversation that you come into that's been going on for a long time and that you're participating in. So you have some hooks for that conversation and you try to be able to be speaking to it. Yeah, so a good place to recognize that would be the journal articles you're using or, or the, the literary theory that you're reading. Yeah, so the question is, a good place to recognize that is in journal articles that you're reading or the literary theory you're reading or the, the stuff in the literature. Yes. Um, with the understanding that a lot of the stuff that you read is badly written, right? <laughs> and not something you want to follow. So you can recognize it. Right? Yes. Yeah. So you want to be writing in the way that is, um, that you appreciate the writing, you know, when you appreciate that writing. Um, but with an emphasis on sort of clarity, on being understandable, and knowing what you're saying and why you're saying it. Uh, you know, I, I again, it's a huge time. But even within a given, a given discipline, there is not a consistent voice or genre anymore. You know, if you, I, I'm not in history, for instance, but I know there are many different yeah. ways to, to do history. Um, and when we become interdisciplinary again, we're bringing different traditions. We're, we're writing for people who've had different PhD experiences. You're, as far as I know, the only person attached to this program who is trained as an so we're trying to do something new here. Mm -hmm. So I just, I wish it was that simple. Like I, I, I yeah, no, and I'm not trying to say that it's simple to pick a genre and write to that genre, or pick a discipline and write to that discipline. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that you can be intentional about how you write. That writing sometimes becomes something that we think we just do it, and it's either clear or not. But that when you write in a particular mode, that is something that you can do with intentionality, right? So that you're saying, this is why I'm writing in this way. Um, that you, you actually reflect on your writing form as a part of the process of writing. So you're not writing for yourself, you're writing for your audience. Yeah, and one of the, you're not writing for yourself, you're writing for your audience. And one of the ways to think about that and to, um, to again, sort of dis disaggregate these two, the person who's writing and the person who's editing and commenting, is to have a sense that when, when you're writing, there's a lot of things that you need to do in order to get traction in your writing in a given day and in a given document. Those might not be the same things that the reader needs to get traction in your writing. So when you're doing processes of revising and thinking about what you're gonna keep in, probably a lot of the things that you can take out will start with, um, you know, in my intro to philosophy classes, the main thing that is just Clearly something that that person needs to get traction for themselves is like, since the beginning of time, humans have debated whether God exists, right? So anything that starts with like, since the beginning of time, which obviously none of you say, is probably just something that needs its attraction getting. But you might have phrases that are ways that you start writing, like, it is interesting that, you know? So those are things that, um, both in phrasing and sometimes just in the stuff that you're saying, you just need that in order to get in and be able to write. And then you want to ask yourself, what will my readers need in order to come in with me to this conversation? So I, I want to, I'm just going to be sort of quick about this because I think Dr. Wilkins is going to say more. But it's worthwhile to always, with this intentionality, have a sense of the through line of the piece of writing. So does each piece of what you're doing contribute to your overall aim? That aim could be very complicated, you know, it could be very subtle. 
but does each part of what you're doing, or it could be very clear and plain, you know, does each part of what you're doing go toward that? And can you say how it's going to your, toward your overall purpose? And maybe if there's something that you really like, but you can't say that it actually does contribute to the purpose of that chapter, it needs to be its own chapter. It wants to move to the introduction. So when you examine your writing in that way, that's a place where you're looking on your printout and you, you know, you draw a little line and you say, move to chapter three, you know? So you, you check the through line as you go. And the through line is something that, depending on what arc you have, you know, there might be a through line in a particular chapter, there might be a through line across, you know, six chapters. It's, you know, you, there are gonna be several in the document depending on how long it is and what's happening. And then the question to ask in relation to that is, would a reader be able to say what you're meaning to do at each part? So when someone's just reading this, would they be able to identify what you're aiming for? And hopefully, the reader would say that. So one thing that really contributes to clear and coherent and strong academic writing is to begin to conceptualize the writing process as um, much bigger than the time where you sit down in front of the computer in order to type and these are a few technologies that I have found incredibly useful for dealing with um, beginning to understand the writing process as a process that involves a whole lot of pre-writing, a set of writing, and a set of revision, where those three stages are actually sort of at least equal to each other, and partially the revision, you know, likely.